Welcome to The World As You'll Know It, a podcast about life after COVID-19. I'm your host, Danielle Mattoon. If we think about the pandemic as a giant global reset, what challenges and possibilities will it bring? That's the question this show is asking. Each week, we invite an established journalist to host a conversation with an expert in their field about how COVID and our response to it will affect the future. This week, we're talking about the future of cities. Our host is Michael Kimmelman, who's been writing about cities for years in his role as the architecture critic for The New York Times. And in a departure from previous episodes, he will be hosting two conversations. The first, about cities and housing, is with Julian Castro, the former mayor of San Antonio, Texas, who also served as Secretary of Housing and Urban Development under President Obama. The second conversation will focus on cities and transportation. Here, Michael will talk to Jeanette Sadi Khan, the former commissioner of the New York City Department of Transportation under Mayor Bloomberg. Here is Michael's conversation with Julian Castro. So, Secretary Castro, thank you for being here today. And uh, it's good to see you again. You know, I don't know if you recall, but we, uh, you came to a cities conference I organized at the Times about five years ago. And we spoke at that time about various crises, which had to do with homelessness and housing prices and the digital divide. And all that seems as much of a problem now as it ever was, but somehow it also seems like in another century. So let, let's go back, I suppose, to the beginning of the year and just pretend uh, that it's January or whatever date before March. What would you describe as the sort of discussion about cities at that point? Before COVID-19, a lot of the discussion about cities has been about the growing challenges in cities with affordable housing, because we'd seen the rents continue to spike all over the country. You know, going into the cities which I did plenty of during the campaign as well, one of the things I would consistently hear about was a dissatisfaction with displacement and gentrification. Whether you're talking about New York City or Atlanta or any number of other places on the ground, hearing from people over and over about their concerns of not being able to afford to live in their neighborhood and the, and the, the, the changing nature of the neighborhood and not so much wanting to to just wipe it all away and stop it, but wanting to be able to be a part of it and still enjoy the neighborhood that they've known. Yeah, I'm glad you used the word displacement because gentrification, I remember talking to the mayor of Detroit not so long ago, and he was boasting about areas of the city that had been gentrified because, of course, in that context, it meant some form of investment, But it's become one of those words. Really, the issue is displacement, right? This fear that development and new new things that happen in communities are going to somehow threaten existing communities, especially uh, poorer communities. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Uh, I saw that across the country. I think a lot of those issues have really come to a head over the last couple of years. That's what we were facing going into... Uh, the emergence of COVID-19. I mean, one could add to that maybe uh, uh, increasing problems of homelessness. Absolutely. Certainly here in big cities. Well, you know, I mean, in the Obama administration, during those years of the Obama administration, homelessness overall went down by about 10%. Veteran homelessness went down from 2010 to 2016 by 47%. So we're headed in the right direction. In the last two years, those numbers have started to tick back upward. So absolutely, the other conversation about cities we were hearing and that you would see with your own eyes would be these encampments. I visited one of these in Oakland, and you had a combination of tents, dilapidated old trailers, just amazing to see in a visually stark way, such an expression of poverty. People didn't usually see that. And so there was a growing consciousness I think, about homelessness and people have different ways that they think we need to solve that challenge. But, you know, there was no denying that it was growing. Since you mentioned homelessness in the Bay Area, I I remember there was a report not uh, long ago by the University of California in San Francisco 
And it said that, which I thought was borne out by what you see on the streets, that now I think 44% of homeless people in San Francisco, in the San Francisco Bay Area, are first-time homeless over the age of 50. So I looked up further what that, how to unpack that number, and it turned out that in, I think, 1990, nationally speaking, that, that constituted 11% of the homeless population, people first-time homeless over 50. Now it's, it's 50% of the homeless population. So clearly this is not just the old problems that have to do with addiction and mental health, but it has to do also with economic hardship and losing jobs. And, Absolutely. Yeah. And so COVID enters this scene and we have 30 million people or something right now threatened with eviction and uh, a whole different sort of landscape of economic uh, hardship for, for housing. And, and, you know, at both in terms of housing, in terms of having to seek unemployment benefits and going to food banks. I had this a fascinating conversation the other day with the director of the San Antonio Food Bank. Uh, before COVID-19, they were serving about 60,000 families a week. Post-COVID-19, during this time period, they're serving 120,000 families. Mm. And he said that he thought, you know, based on the research that they've done, that about 50% of those people that came to get sacks of groceries during their lines during COVID were new to this. This was the first time they, they'd ever had to avail themselves of a food bank. And so it is fascinating what we have with COVID-19. It's just accelerated that effect that you're talking about. Yeah. I mean, it's also created another problem, right, which is that you have now in cities like New York, where I am now, an affluent class of people who many of them fled town. You have crumbling tax revenues, and there's a need to bring back affluent population and secure businesses, make sure they don't leave. You know, how do you balance that with the, obviously these now growing needs of a broadened class of people? I think this is where cities have to go full bore into investing in a common denominator here, which is quality of life. Think about the role that parks are playing these days, our libraries, uh, the arts. You know, your question is about attracting people back, making sure you keep uh, folks, and then also, of course, providing a reason for people who are still there to stay. You want to make a city that's a appealing to everyone. I believe that those those things I just mentioned are going to be more important than ever in in maintaining uh, this fabric of the city. Yeah. I mean, it is a hard sell, as you say, because, uh, you know, the mayor here in New York is being chastised by business leaders for not making clear that quality of life, by which I think they mean safe streets, uh, subways, sanitation, and so forth, basic stuff are being um, you know taken care of. So things like the arts and parks often those those are a hard sell, I think, don't you? Economically, uh, they are. You know, you absolutely need to get the basics of of the city right, or else people will go somewhere else, and so basic infrastructure, basic public safety, and so forth. But the city throughout time, throughout history, and in 21st century America goes beyond just those basic functions. And if somebody wanted somebody wanted those things, right, I mean, they, they could go live in, in, in many suburbs that don't really uh, cater much to those quality of life aspects. And so I actually believe that if you're, if you're a mayor out there, you cover the basics, but get creative and focus on those things that, that define why people want to live in a great city in the first place. Yeah. So, okay. So put your mayor's hat back on. Mm -hmm. I mean, what would you be your top priority now? Two or three things. What would you be pushing? Uh, I mean, number one, safety, but, you know, just sort of spinning this forward a little bit. We know that we're going to have tough times when we're talking about city budgets, we need to figure out how we can smartly use the resources we have and whether we have to garner new revenues to be able to help the community get back up on its feet. Here in San Antonio, for instance, they're, they're running an eighth of a cent sales tax increase in November to invest in workforce development. 
and we need to put people back to work, the, the city needs to play its part along with the state government, the federal government, and of course, the private sector. Yeah. I mean, you mentioned also, look, I mean, the, the problems are huge and you can't solve everything with an eighth of a cent. No doubt. No doubt. Yeah. Of, of course, mayors alone can't solve the problems we're talking about. One, one of the things you just mentioned was private money. And one of the strategies for financing things uh, basically has been public-private partnerships, but uh, there's been growing resentment about these arrangements, which by their nature benefit private interests as well as public ones. So how do you see the role of private money going forward? When it comes to housing, we absolutely should invest more public dollars in housing opportunity. I believe that we need to recommit ourselves as a nation to smart public housing. We have about 1.1 million units of public housing. Every year we lose about 10,000 units to disrepair. NYCHA in New York is a perfect example of so many of the challenges that public housing authorities face. You're talking about dilapidated units, dangerous units, wait lists for public housing and for Section 8 vouchers. I mean, it just runs the gamut. You're, you're, you know, on a hamster wheel going nowhere. At the same time, I also recognize that, look, we have a a system in place that absolutely is intertwined with the private sector. You think about probably the most effective way that we've created affordable units over the last few decades, the low-income housing tax credit. In addition to that, the Section 8 program itself, itself, housing choice vouchers, essentially that give somebody a voucher to go into the private market, right, and and get the housing that, that they choose. So those are opportunities to engage the private sector. Now, it would not be a surprise to anybody listening that I'm a big fan of of greater governmental investment in something like affordable housing. But I also do think that there is a role for the private sector. The FHA is a great example of that. Uh, And we're not just going to walk away from all of that, obviously. The, The private sector has a role to play in it. You know, it is interesting. I think most Americans may not realize how much the government has gotten out of the public housing business over the last 50 years. Really, it's back to Nixon. If you suddenly were president and you now could enact some sort of housing policy at a federal level, what what are the like two or three basic points that you would try to pursue to ensure both the distribution of that housing and then the the location of that housing so that it had the best effect on on the people who live there? I'd make sure that we're investing so that we have ample supply of housing that's affordable to the middle class and lower income Americans as the rents have skyrocketed, that we get resources directly into the hands of middle class and lower income families so they can get into that housing. And also that we do something the Trump administration has absolutely turned its back on, which is to really enforce the Fair Housing Act of 1968 so that you ensure that we get closer to fair housing opportunity for everyone in this country. The last analysis I remember that HUD had done from a few years ago was that when a black American goes into the housing market trying to get an apartment or, or a home, they're still... 10 to 12 percent more likely to be discriminated against versus a non-Hispanic white. And Latinos also face that, Asian Americans, Native Americans. So we need a policy that enforces the Fair Housing Act. We have to be mindful of what's happening in terms of displacement. Well, how do you make a policy that both creates greater affordable housing opportunity, but also helps ensure that people can stay in place if that's what they want to do? That, to me, is the challenge, is that the rubber hits the road when you get to how do you do that. And in San Francisco and in New York, particularly for HUD when I was there, we were grappling with, okay, when an affordable housing project goes up, under our civil rights laws, under the Fair Housing Act, how much are we able to do to to give preference, for instance, to people who have lived in the community already so that they can stay? Right, without running afoul of the law. That's where it gets interesting, right? And so Because they're not the only people who need housing, but there is a desire to keep the community. Well and also, together. I mean, because it becomes race conscious, because you may have an aggregation yeah. of Latinos that live in an area or African Americans that live in an area or people of other backgrounds. And so if in fact that policy ends up 
overwhelmingly favoring people of one background, then do you run afoul of the Fair Housing Act or other civil rights laws? Yeah. Can be a legal minefield. Yeah. Let's zoom out for a second and look at the future of cities. Um, What's your reaction to the pandemic mantra that cities are dying now? No, yeah, no, no, no. Look, I mean, I completely get it, right? I mean, we've read these articles about people leaving San Francisco, people leaving New York. I don't think so. I believe that there is something about cities that is both charming and also is basic to the human experience and what people want. People, as as has often been said, are social beings. Think about why this has been such a shock to so many of us. I mean, people are not able to spend time in person together at birthday parties or weddings or a graduation or even, sadly, people's funerals. And everybody misses that. They miss going to the movies. And and so as long as that is part of the human experience, and I believe it always will be, then there will always be a role for cities. It may not look the same, and I do think that, at least in the short term, we may see more growth in some of the suburbs and and even outline areas from there. But I'm confident that cities are always going to play a prominent role in our national experience and in the human experience. Of course, after 9-11, the uh, you know, smart money was everyone's going to abandon the cities, businesses will leave New York, no one's ever going to build another tall building yeah, again. It's just gotten more and more expensive, and, right? <laughs> yeah. More, the biggest skyscraper construction boom in American history. Yeah. So I'm, I'm with you on that. I think that's unlikely. Um, I want to switch gears here and talk a little bit about the city uh, you grew up in, the city where you became mayor and where you're now living again. Maybe you can tell me a little bit about growing up in San Antonio. I grew up on the west side of San Antonio in the 70s and 80s, and the west side of San Antonio was very much economically segregated and ethnically segregated, basically lower income and lower middle income, over 80% Mexican-American. My brother and I went to the public schools there on the west side. I mean, but it was an exciting neighborhood in so many ways. People would sit out on the front porch in the evening. My grandmother had friends in the neighborhood, and they would sit on the porch and drink an old Milwaukee at night, and the kids would be running around, and you had a whole bunch of characters in the neighborhood. There was a little uh, convenience store, or, or tienda, as they say in Spanish, and the panaderia, the bakery, and little Mexican restaurants around there that we would walk to. And there was a real sense, I think, of community and of character to it that I know certainly shaped who I am. And like a lot of parents, um, in so many ways, I miss that for my kids because I don't live that far away from where I grew up, but a, a greater sense of community, of safety, of you know, knowing people around. I think a lot of that is missing. It's not the same. And so how do we build communities that, that do provide opportunities like that. It's interesting you describe the city as essentially a town. I myself grew up in a neighborhood in New York City uh, in the village, and it, and it was a village. Increasingly in this country, we've created this cultural divide, right, between the rural and the urban, but that shared desire for community and place is really not owned by a rural community. It's felt by people in cities too. So pulling back, and thinking about all the challenges we've talked about in the context of crises creating opportunities. Just to end, what do you think our greatest opportunity coming out of this is now? Creating a sense of national purpose. I mean, people who were around from the moon landing, uh, a sense of common unity. There's a moment that we have here under the right hands of leadership where we may be able to create more common sense of purpose and unity. Thank you very much. um, uh, It's a pleasure to talk to you, and I'm grateful. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Housing is, of course, one huge challenge facing cities. Transit is another. Jeanette Sadikan ran the New York City Department of Transportation under Mayor Bloomberg. In order to weather this pandemic and prosper after it, she says, investing in transit must be a number one priority. Here's her conversation with Michael. Jeanette, it's good to talk to you. Thanks for joining. Great to be here, Michael. 
You were the transportation commissioner in New York for years, and in that role, kind of a human pinata, <laughs> criticized for bringing about lots of change in the city, uh, adding bike lanes, pedestrianizing streets, turning parking areas into public plazas. So you know how change happens, how hard it can be to bring about, and also what the results can be. We wanted to talk today, since we're at this critical juncture where a lot of crises have converged for cities, the pandemic, an economic crisis, a racial reckoning. The Regional Plan Association, a not-for-profit pillar of the planning establishment, just came out with a report saying that the biggest single threat to New York's recovery is a potential deterioration of public services, especially public transit. How have you been seeing all this play out? Well, I think that the pandemic has challenged a lot of our underlying assumptions about about health, about education, about politics. I mean, you see it every single day how this is affecting you know, our lives. And it also transformed transportation overnight. When the economy seized up in March with a pandemic, traffic dropped 50% across the United States. In New York City, it was down 94%, uh, 80% in Los Angeles, 76% in London, and almost 90% in Paris. And transit ridership, to your earlier point, is is also down, you know, 65% in American cities. And now we've lost the equivalent of 400 million jobs, you know, in just the second quarter alone. So millions of more people are working from home. And that's, you know, a transformative change. And in New York City, what we what we found before the pandemic, you know, to the, the investment strategies is, you know, the same strategies that we're, cities are looking to follow now after COVID, you know, making streets more accessible for people who are walking and biking and making transit investments. Those are the same strategies that we've followed in New York City to improve the quality of life and the sustainability of the city. Those are the same strategies. We created 400 miles of bike lanes, as you know, 8.6 million New Yorkers. We had 8.6 million you know, opinions on whether that was a good thing or not. Um, yep. But a lot of times what happens is that kind of transformative change while people are upset with the status quo, you know, it doesn't take very long until they adapt. And so what you're seeing in a lot of cities around the world right now is these mayors are making the kinds of investments that they would make by the year 2030 as part of their long range sustainability plans. They're making them in 2020. First of all, the, the resistance to public transit seems of almost an American trait. And which is an odd thing because it's it's so connected to equity and health and the quality of air and so forth. And yet it runs up against this notion in America of, you know, a person's right to their own car, to a parking space. One of the most profound things I think about the changes that you help bring about in the city is to remind people that the streets were not permanently this way. They weren't, you know, originally built for cars. Overnight parking used to be, you know, illegal in New York City that we've essentially adapted the city to the car. So I guess one of the questions is, how do we make people realize uh, or, or accept a change when it's attached almost to a, a politics of self-identity? Well, you know, that's, there, there's a lot of history behind those, those questions. And a lot of European cities emerged long before the automotive age. And are built around walkable neighborhoods, you know, narrow streets and public squares that, you know, the city kind of organically grew up around. But that doesn't explain everything. You know, the longer answer is that some of the most people friendly cities that we like to talk about as models for walking and biking, you know, Copenhagen and Amsterdam. What we see today wasn't something that was handed down from antiquity. We can change our streets. And one of the very first things that they consciously did in the last 50 years is to reclaim their street space from cars and in response to traffic deaths and the oil shock of the of the 1970s. And they put down this brand new infrastructure to make it easier for people to walk and bike. So it's not just a European thing that, that we're seeing. We're also seeing U.S. cities get that the road to recovery runs along our streets. And so, you know, in Seattle, Mayor uh, Jenny Durkin is making the 20 miles of her shared streets that were interim now permanent. You know, Oakland's putting down 74 miles of shared streets. Chicago, Denver, dozens of American cities are pedestrianizing their streets. And you look closer to home in New York City, it's incredible to see what's happening. More than 10,000 restaurants have been certified to offer outdoor dining 
since this summer. They've taken up 15,000 parking spaces. So when you think about it, like back in New York City, if I had taken away 15,000 parking spaces, I would have had an extremely short tenure. <laughs> I mean, this is this is sort of what I was saying before, that not you were a pinata for trying to take away a few parking spaces in in localized places. But obviously, the pandemic has accelerated the ability and uh, and put a fire under, you know, the seat of a few politicians to make a much larger scale change. And beyond the pandemic, I mean, what's interesting about the pandemic, right, is that like many crises in the past, it's also an opportunity to for, for change, for, for wholesale change, not just small scale change. So let's say you are suddenly put in charge of solving global transit. Uh, what do you do? Clearly, we are at a moment where we can't go back to the status quo. Our status quo streets were broken. <laughs> you know, we had a million three traffic deaths uh, on our roads every year, 4.2 million people dying of pollution. We have a climate crisis and global warming. I mean, the status quo is really not where we need to go back. And so we've learned the lessons that we can't work backwards on things like traffic. And, you know, we have to provide more choices for, for how people get around. People drive either when they don't have a choice or when they believe that driving is the best option. And so we need to change that equation by making uh, better options for getting around, making it easier to take buses and trains and, and to walk and, and bike for more trips. And you're not going to wish people out of cars. You know, and there's always going to be a pushback, but strong leaders understand that the road to recovery runs along our streets and we can make this happen. And they're the ones that are going to be ensure that we don't just recover, but we prosper going forward. And there's always pushback when you, when you do this. I mean, but there's a huge cost to doing nothing. And we can't have a car-based recovery. We need to be adapting our cities to people and not to cars. Yeah. And city leaders can't be standing around and just waiting to decide what role cars are going to play in the recovery. So, Well, fair enough. But, I mean, you've had so far, I think, maybe traffic, car traffic is back to at least 70% of what it was before the pandemic started. And subways in New York City, to stick with the New York example, uh, you know, ridership is is still way down. I think between buses and subways, it almost reached 3 million again, but that's far, far below what it was as a daily ridership. And one of the reasons, obviously, is is fear, but it's a vicious cycle, right? People are afraid, even if it's not in the science, there's no proof that that's dangerous. People are afraid to go. That reduces revenues. And I think the Independent Budget Office now estimates a $4.5 billion hole in the city's 2022 budget. And, you know, that obviously is going to have implications for paying for the kinds of maintenance upgrades the subway system was failing before this that are going to encourage people to go back. So how do you overcome this problem that the very thing you need people to do more of is the very thing you now can't pay for? Well, there are uh, about four questions in that statement right there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the biggest challenge we face coming out of this pandemic is fear. One of the problems that we have certainly on the transit front is there were a lot of headlines very early on about how transit was a super spreader. And in fact, what we've seen is transit is not a super spreader, right? That's not been the problem. There have been studies after studies that show that that's, there's no link between transit use and coronavirus spreading. You know, in Hong Kong, seven and a half million people you know, one of the highest transit use cities in the world has less cases than Kansas, right? The issue is really more where you're going to and not how you're getting there. So the way out of this crisis runs along our subway rails and bus lanes because we have to restore transit and we have to get uh, people back to their jobs. Uh, and that's part of the economic recovery that we need to get done. And New York and cities need a massive economic expansion in order to avert the kind of mobility meltdown that we're going to that will swallow them if former commuters take to cars. So we really need a WPA for the for the MTA. And so you're talking about a federal influx of money as well. Yeah, when you think about it, GM and Ford got an 80 billion dollar bailout, right? Taxpayers were repaid in in fairly short order and we're going to see the same kind of return here. But we, yeah. you know, and you see what's happening in terms of the federal strategy and bailing out the airlines. The airlines are getting this huge bailout. Transit, nothing. Transit moves 16 times the number of people than airlines do on a daily basis. 
Yeah. Obviously, there are headlines about rising crime in the subways and these there's a kind of impulse to remember the dark days of New York as if we're going back to them. I mean, crime rates across the city while ticking up in some areas are spectacularly low compared to what they used to be. But it's partly about making people feel that they're safe Mm -hmm. um, to, to go back to public transit. That has to be something that obviously comes from leaders has to be something people convey uh, from the top that that this kind of transportation is, you know, fine. I couldn't agree more. I mean, there's a lot that cities can do right now to win back back riders and, you know, create a kind of post-COVID covenant. Riders are reassured when they see people cleaning the stations and cleaning the turnstiles. And cities like Boston and Chicago, you know, have taken very strong messages forward and shown what can be done. Yeah. You know, I think New York needs to restore its subway service back to 24-hour service, you know? I mean, there's a connection, right, between public transit and economic health. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, it's it's the key to our recovery. It's critical that we do not just have a car-based recovery. You know, a worst-case scenario for New York is is actually adding a traffic crisis to the health and economic and racial justice crisis. You know, cities aren't going to recover if people can't get what they're where they're going quickly and easily and safely. And with unemployment at its highest level since the Depression, getting people back to work depends on having safe options. I mean, could you just make the case what the financial dividend is for a real investment uh, in public transit? How, how would, if you were arguing this in Washington, what are the first things you would say? Well, there is no better investment than in transit. It's a four to one return on the dollar. That means for every dollar you invest in transit, there's four dollars of return. And so when you think about the economic returns to businesses that are easily accessible near transit, you take a look at the property values of homes that are located near transit. You know, there's a huge increase in property values when you are living in an accessible neighborhood, accessible by transit. You look at the environmental benefits. I mean, we can no longer pretend that we are not in the midst of a climate crisis. And so there's that. And and then there's a basic pocketbook dividend. Owning a car, $10,000 a year to buy, maintain, and park. And so with that money, you can put that to education. You can put that to a down payment. You can take care of childcare. You know, all the kind of expenses for living. So we really need to have a national strategy that is focused on a strong transit investment. So, Jeanette, just to end, tell me what our cities should look like in, say, 10 years. What could we accomplish if we make the right kinds of investments and seize the opportunity of this moment, crisis though it is? Well, you know, when you think about it, cities around the world have been working on an outdated operating code. During the 20th century, we had this philosophy that work was over here and restaurants were over there and school was over here. And, you know, that kind of planning required people to drive everywhere. It kind of was the kindling that the world's traffic problems are built on. And so I think the smart mobility innovation of the 21st century isn't spaceports and, you know, flying cars and using tech to reduce car traffic. I think it's building a city where you don't have to drive in the first place, what a lot of people are calling a 15-minute city where you can get to everything you need within a 15-minute walk or bike. And it's not just a great mobility principle, although it's good for that. It's it's healthier to be able to get to places uh, with active transportation. It's better for the local economy if everybody can buy from local merchants rather than national chains. It's better access for older uh, residents and great for kids. So, I mean, it's better for equity and opportunity, you know, so you can have better access, doesn't limit your access to jobs and schools and services. And so many cities have been striving for that. You've probably seen that in Melbourne and Copenhagen. And and when you look at a city that way, you know, the street can be very different. And so I think the question is, how do we design cities and streets to accommodate the people who live there with enough room for people to be together and yet safely distant? And so I think there are all sorts of possibilities for how we can make that happen. And it's really exciting to see the down payment of these new strategies you know, that mayors are making all around the world. Hey, Jeanette, thank you so much for talking. This has been great. Michael, wonderful to be with you. Thank you for listening to The World As You'll Know It. Michael Kimmelman is the architecture critic for The New York Times. Julian Castro is the former mayor of San Antonio, Texas, 
and former Secretary of Housing and Urban Development in the Obama administration. Jeanette Sadi Khan served as the Commissioner of the New York City Department of Transportation under Mayor Bloomberg and is now a principal with Bloomberg Associates. You can find links to their work and more in our show notes. This podcast is brought to you by Aventine Research Institute a nonprofit dedicated to supporting work that helps us understand the long-term consequences of today's decisions and behaviors on the future. I'm Danielle Mattoon, Editorial Director. The views expressed are those of the participants and do not represent those of Aventine, its employees, or affiliates. This podcast is produced in partnership with Pineapple Street Studios. To find out more or listen to the full season, go to aventine.org. 